In this section, I'm going to go into detail about agile development and the tricks and methods I've used over the years. Before doing that, I want to give you a little bit more background. So this all comes back to TPS, the Toyota Production System. I heard of just-in-time production and inventory, but it wasn't until I read the goal by Goldroth and Cox that I understood the background and the theory of constraints. This is an integrated social technical system developed by Toyota that comprises its management philosophy and practices. The TPS organizes manufacturing and logistics for the automotive manufacturer, including interaction with suppliers and customers. The system is a major precursor to the more generic lean manufacturing. Takahi Ono and E.G. Toyota Japanese industrial engineers developed this system between 1948 and 1975. Originally called just-in-time production, it builds on the approach created by the founder of Toyota, his son, and the engineer Takahishi Ono, and the principles underlying the TPS are embodied in what is now commonly known as the Toyota way. Next, we're going to talk about agile adoption and the typical issues getting an organization to buy into lean development, becoming a learning organization, and following DevOps practices. Why is adopting lean practices hard yet rewarding? As any major change, this transformation is often disruptive and gets a lot of initial resistance from the organization, yet the benefits of this change to the organization have been proven over years and years by multiple successful companies. One reason this transformation is so hard is due to pressure from management to meet unrealistic deadlines and release dates that drive the quality of the product down and leave an immense amount of code debt. Truth is, it takes time and dedication to get the system down, so commitment to the process is essential. From my experience, the method it is adopted best when management is trained in at first, i.e. the top-down approach. Now I'll go into the essential rituals and practices in Lean. The morning status meeting slash stand-up is where the change begins. The simple meeting brings transparency to the team and the organization and is open to anybody. The format is simple. Everyone takes no more than five minutes to communicate three possible things to the team. What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do today? Do I have any tasks blocked? This meeting helps everyone stay on the same page. It's important to note that this is strictly an informational meeting. If you need to discuss any particulars of what you or your team member is working on, it needs to be done after the meeting involving only the affected team members. We don't want to waste anybody's time. Next, quarterly monthly feature planning meetings. These are planning meetings where features are talked about and basic estimates are made on the feature development, testing, and deployment. Rule of thumb is to only commit to releases on a quarterly basis, not on a given date. This prevents marketing from not, and other departments from committing to launch dates that cause the whole development cycle to be thrown into chaos, causing missed releases and looking foolish to customers. The last one is visualize your work in progress. This has to do with a core component called WIP. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail shortly. IT work and projects can be highly interruptive and have lots of dependencies. This creates an issue on how to properly identify and manage IT DevOps work. The Phoenix project teaches us how to categorize IT and DevOps tasks into four types of work. The lack of this insight plagued me for years. Knowing how to juggle the priorities of keeping up on maintenance, managing changes, addressing break-fix work, and implementing new solutions for the business is critical. I've been using this for a number of years now and it's changed my world in how I manage and prioritize my daily work. So let's go over them. The four types of work are business projects, IT projects, unplanned work, and changes. Over the years I've come up with a way to divide the work pretty evenly across these four types that maintain an organization's ability to meet their goals from a business perspective but also make sure that they are properly maintaining their infrastructure environment. 
the prioritization of this is about 50% of your time should be spent in business projects, about 20% of your time in IT projects, hopefully 10% of your time in unplanned work, and 20% of your time in daily administrative tasks like adding accounts and firewall rules. Kanban is a method for managing knowledge work with an emphasis on just-in-time delivery while not overloading the team members. In this approach, the process from definition of a task to its delivery to the customer is displayed for participants to see. Team members pull work from a queue. This is the beauty and the curse of the Kanban board. So what does a Kanban board allow you to do? It allows you to visualize work in progress, start to finish, and helps to identify a bottleneck. To be honest, I've looked around and haven't found a better way to show work in progress. The basics of a Kanban are the backlog, to do, doing, and done. This is the basis of all Kanban boards. The one thing about Kanban is that it's supposed to match your needs and you can add and remove columns as needed. Let's talk about the particulars of Kanban. First, the Kanban card. So a little history of Kanban card and what does it entail? Kanban is a Japanese word for visual sign or card. In the late 1940s, Toyota line workers pioneered the use of physical Kanban cards to signal steps in their manufacturing process. What is on it? A unique identifier, an activity name, a rough estimate, and a who's working on the card and a color. The card format works for DevOps and development, which will include the name of the task or a number, who's responsible for completing the task, a color to represent the type of work on a task, bug feature work or the four types of work, a legend on the side of the Kanban board to describe what the colors mean for your organization. Next, work in progress or whip. This is the theory of constraints in practice. The underlining premise of the theory of constraints is that organizations can be measured and controlled by variations on three measures, throughput, operational expense, and inventory. Inventory is all the money that the system has invested in purchasing the things it intends to sell. Operational expense is all the money the system spends in order to turn inventory into throughput, and throughput is the rate at which a system generates money through sales. As a general rule, a single person can't have more than two things in progress. The idea is to focus on one thing until completion. However, in reality, things happen and you're blocked. Switching tasks is cognitively expensive. Studies have shown that the average person wastes 30% of their workday just by switching tasks. Thus, we try to work on one thing at a time and switch only when blocked. Next, swim lanes. A swim lane is a way of grouping and categorizing the tasks together on the Kanban board. For any team, prioritization and grouping of tasks is very important. The team needs to know which tasks are higher priority, have a clear distinction between features and departments to ensure that the work on the task is much more streamlined. You can choose to set up your swim lanes in a variety of different ways. One way is to represent issue priority. The further down in the rows you go, the lower the issue priority. Example, expedite, high, normal, etc. Another way is for user stories and features. Example, feature A, feature B, and feature C all having separate swim lanes. The third and most common is to divide tasks between departments. For example, development, design, admin, and operations. Next, the ops board explained. The flow across the ops board. After years of running ops teams and managing numerous Kanban boards, I've arrived at the most optimal way, in my opinion, to set up columns and swim lanes for DevOps. The flow across the ops board. So here are some of my tips and tricks. How cards come into the backlog. Business projects and other work are broken down into tasks. Then cards are created based on the four types of work. Next tip is how they get selected for work. At standup, from the backlog, they are selected based on business needs and priority. A healthy mix of work in progress is 50% business projects, 20% changes, and 20% IT projects, aka preventive maintenance, 
all in task and in process, leaving around 10% for break fix work. Rip, whip rules that work. Two tasks are allowed per team member in progress at a time. Here is the ops board. As you can see, there is a to do in queue. Let's go into the board in more detail by breaking down purposes of the different columns. So the to do is the backlog of all the tasks, all requests and business projects broken down by task and placed in the to do. The next column is the in queue. Queue holds the priorities tasks that need to be pulled next. These are prioritized at the beginning of a stand-up meeting before the teams go over their individual status. Note, this can be changed during the day in a dynamic way, and in the, especially in the ever-changing world of DevOps and its priorities, how they switch hour to hour. Next is third-party block column. DevOps teams work on a lot of things that are dependent on other parties, such as dev, business owners, vendors, and suppliers. Usually this would be put into a whip column, but because DevOps gets blocked a lot, it's a lot more efficient to place them there until the dependency could be met. These tasks take priority over pulling new tasks into the queue, and you should still only have two active tasks in progress. In progress is self-explanatory. All tasks are in progress. Deployment is one of the unique ways ops work is that a task is not done until it's signed off and accepted into production. Deployment isn't always the end of a project. Sometimes hotfixes, configuration changes are needed after the initial deployment to make things work in production. This is the reason for a deployment column. It catches a lot of the gray area around deployments but still shows work in progress. Now let's talk about swim lanes. Swim lanes are used to break work across multiple teams, projects, or different priorities like fires and outages. To add transparency to the organization as a whole, however, they have a hidden issue. The issue with them is that it makes it harder to track tasks between the same project. Work can be passed through the same columns multiple times when passed between teams. For example, when the design team has a task and then the ops team works on that same task it makes it hard to gather capacity as a team as a whole and doesn't allow you to get an idea of the cadence of the team's progress. The solution if work is moving from team to team and highly dependent is to add more columns to accommodate the other teams. For example, adding additional in progress and done to track tasks till all the tasks complete across all teams. I usually set up two swim lanes, maintenance and outage slash fire. The maintenance. Maintenance tasks should be 20% of all projects in process. Maintenance is crucial as over time it saves us from the constant firefighting from smaller issues ballooning into bigger ones. You make the time investment ahead of time and schedule this work in advance. Make sure it's 20% of your time at least. If you run, into run out of preventative projects, then research and implement extra capacity, scalability, and resiliency. This is the Kaizen cycle of the infrastructure. The next swim lane is outage and fires. These cards are meant to track fires on a weekly basis or at least document the causes of outages to be discussed and eliminated. Outage slash fire cards are meant to give transparency to outages and let the team know they need to drop everything and help in any way possible. All hands on deck in these type of situations. It's important to know any fire outage task blocks all other tasks in progress. If you ever get into a point in time where 10% or more of your time in the cycle is spent fighting fires, reduce your business projects and add 30% of your time to preventive maintenance until you stabilize and resolve the issues. To recap, ops board notes. So card types should be based on the type of work. You're going to need a lot more columns than to do, doing and done. Swim lanes to divide up the work based on teams and a fire lane for outage responses to add transparency and manage the outage. So these are the common pitfalls of Kanban and Ops. Not controlling work in progress, doing a lot of rework by not automating core functions, and not dealing with third party de dependencies. This brings us to the end. So 
What is Kanban good for? It's good for rapid development, works in highly disruptive environments where long-term planning is hard, preferred for IT and ops because of its agility and ability to adapt.